That's what I was saying. <laughs> just, just to, just to, uh, I, I think you summed it up very well, and, and you made a lot of good points. We are not sitting here saying that India is bed of free, or bed of roses, or for that matter, like any other emerging market, as you put it very nicely. It's got its own risk. What we are trying to say is, do not get frightened away by certain media reports, thinking that you overblow the risk and you get all hesitant and you say the country is going to hell or something. It's not the case. It's doing very well. Put the risk, keep that in mind, keep at the back of your mind. Uh, as you said, there are certain parts of the country that maybe might be a bit more riskier than others. And coming back to what I said earlier, understand the country, understand where you're getting and what you're getting into. Because just as some parts might be doing badly or risk, there are other parts that are doing very well. There are a lot of foreigners doing well. Uh, there are problems in, in any country that size with anti-social elements creating all kinds of mischief. That, that is true. If you, if you look at uh, c uh, crime rates, we don't, we don't propose that uh, you know, India is very safe. Yes, it has got a lot of crime rate. Singapore, for that matter, crime rate is going through the sky. I never used to see so many murders happening in, when I was young. Does that make Singapore unlivable? Does that mean we should pack up and go somewhere else? No. What I'm saying is keep that in your mind. You do your safeguards. You do your due diligence. You take your deterrent actions. But going where there, there is opportunity. Don't let go on that. I fully agree with you. Uh, I used to live in China myself. I was in China myself. So I know exactly what you're talking about. China started its reforms in 1978. It has now come to a level where it's doing very well. India started much later. But if we could turn the clock back a bit, say two, two decades, those people with the hindsight that we have today, those who did not go into China will rush it. Right? Because they'll say, now I know what it's going to grow. But in 1978, at least until even the late 80s, there were a lot of people skeptical about China. They didn't want to go in, as you said it. But had they known what they know today, they would have gone in. We are sitting in the same position today with India. There's a lot of skeptics who are not going in. Strangely enough, Singapore and Singaporeans with the geographical proximity, with the cultural familiarity, we are hesitant. It is the Americans and the Russians, I mean the Russians have been there, the Americans, the Koreans, the Taiwanese, they are taking the gauntlet and going in and making hay out of sunshine. But the difference between um, India and China is that within, with China, majority of the people are Chinese and the, when it comes to poor, uh, uh, religious problems, there's so, not so much. And with, with India, there are a lot of religious problems that really, you know, like in Singapore, I'm very proud to have a mosque, a temple, or whatever, next to each other and, you know, everybody respect each other, especially you go to, you know, the Kuang Yin in Waterloo Street. The Chinese can be going from, from the temple, the Chinese temple, and going to the Indian temple and doing this, and then going off. And was like, hey, that's fantastic. And I was so proud. And when my Canadian friends went, came to Singapore, the first thing I wanted to show them is that, look, this is how we, we this is a multiracial country, a really multiracial country, where everybody respects everybody, and everybody tolerates everybody's religion. And that's one problem that India has, which is also... I, 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 sorry, I beg to defer on that. I think uh, you, you're not giving India's due credit. <laughs> we cannot compare a four million strong country yeah, yeah. to a I billion. Mm -hmm. You cannot say because 50 people killed each other, the rest of the country is burning up. If you look at tolerance across a country, like I said, even some 14% of the population Muslim gives you 170 billion uh, million people Muslims living in India. And many of them doing very well and, and, and living a very harmonious life. The number of Christians, the number of Sikhs, it's the only country in the world where a minority has become a prime minister. Keep that in mind. A minority today, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who's an extremely intelligent man and extremely capable leader, is a Sikh. No other country in the world has respected a minority with a prime minister. Even in Singapore, I remember on one National Day rally, Lee Kuan Yew said, Dana Balan has the brains to become a prime minister, but we cannot accept an Indian as a prime minister. Go check your records. We have our own shortcomings. Do not look at the small picture. Look at the big picture. If there are 50 people dying somewhere, there's a billion and 100 million people living harmoniously. you got to look at the big picture. We live in a small country, we don't need to be small-minded about things. <laughs> no, there are many people in India, I tell you, in Bombay itself, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how many of you have been there, but there's a Muslim mosque called Haji Ali uh, in the heart of the city in Bombay. 
Uh, it's one of the oldest mosques in India today. I myself, including all my relatives, on a given day during uh, the specific days during the year, we visit that mosque ourselves because they say that when you go there, and whatever you ask for, your wishes come true. And I know tons of Hindus who actually step into that mosque. So there is that racial harmony. There are a bunch of people who are extremists who are infiltrating through the, you know, through the Himalayan mountains from Kashmir and Afghanistan, which India has been trying to fight for for the longest time. But that is just a small section. We are looking at the bigger picture about investment opportunities in India. And as a business, what are the opportunities? Here you have a market which is one billion people. You have big uh, spending power people. So I mean, if you're going to be distracted by these small, small packets of problems, you're, not, you're missing the bigger picture and missing the opportunities to get it. Yes, it has its fair share of problems, but the opportunities are far more. Yes, there are risks, but the returns are there as well. So that is something that you have to weigh out yourself, how much risk you want to take and how much returns you're looking for and in what way. That's why be careful. We're not saying that, yes, India is uh, it's free from all problems. You go and everything is nice and dandy. It's not. There are lots of issues. Today, even I'm having issues with certain legal problems. We've, my father had supplied material to India on credit, taken them to the court. 16 years, I'm still fighting the case in court and still not realize my money. So these are problems. You are going to face this kind. That is why I but, kept... But he's making money from other transactions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to move on. You have to move on, basically. You have to get yourself together. But there are issues even in the legal system. So be careful with your credit terms, with your payment terms. I even said that earlier on. There are opportunities, but be careful Sorry. of all of this. She wanted to ask something. Sure. I, I want to be fair. I just came back from India. I traveled long distances from Bangalore over to Northern Kerala by myself. Very well, I defend the countries. So to be fair, India is not all bad. Um, but I have a question. My interest is in the knowledge. KPOs. Uh, mm. Bangalore is getting too expensive, especially compared to Singapore. It's actually a little bit more expensive. So go to go to two tire cities, three tire cities. Go to smaller cities. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, uh, Hydro Blood is trying to catch up, and the is doing a very good job because the government is very pro business, but Karnataka is caught up by its own policies. Which is which are the emerging cities that I should say? You know, uh, you raise a very good point. I I always advise the uh, people who are looking to go to India who come to the chamber. Uh, I said, look, don't everybody, every time I want to take someone to India, they don't feel that they've gone to India unless they visited Bangalore. They all want to go to Bangalore, and after Bangalore, it's Bombay, and after Bombay, it's New Delhi. Why? Well, Bangalore, they've heard, is the IT capital. Everything is fantastic. So Microsoft is there, Bill Gates is there, everything is there. So we must go to Bangalore. And then, of course, Bombay is the financial capital. And then after all that, it's New Delhi where the leaders are. So we must see, go to New Delhi. You know, S S Singapore as a country has done very well, but we don't have many large corporations. When our SMEs are generally small in nature. And I always advise them, do not try to get into a market and fight where the big 800-pound gorillas are there. The US, the US companies or the German companies or Japanese companies are there. You go there, you're not going to get the treatment you want because you're nobody. Right? And two, the cost is already high. As you correctly put it, Bangalore is fast pricing itself out of the market. You can't get a hotel room also. 